Grandma, please, I want to live here with you. In the middle of the night, amidst the winter chill that seeped to the bone, my five-year-old granddaughter, Kate, knocked on my door alone with a heartfelt plea. I couldn't hide my surprise and confusion at her unexpected visit. What happened? Where are your dad and mom? They moved to a new place with my sister, leaving me behind. What do you mean? I was confused by Kate's words and couldn't grasp them right away. But as she elaborated, my heart filled with anger and surprise, leaving me speechless. Is that true? I can't believe a parent would do such a thing. I, Sally, have lived alone since losing my husband a few years ago. However, thanks to his substantial savings and my income, I've never been in financial distress. I rarely feel lonely, especially with my daughter's family living nearby, and I've cherished our family bond. Kate has a twin sister, Mina, who is also five years old. As fraternal twins, they don't look much alike. To me, both Kate and Mina are equally dear granddaughters. I believed I had been giving them equal love, but it seemed there was an unfair difference in my daughter and her spouse's attitudes. Every time I saw my granddaughters, Mina was dressed in flamboyant clothes with frills and lace, whereas Kate always wore simple, undecorated plain clothes. Despite being twins, this treatment disparity always bothered me. My daughter Kelly often spoke of Mina, mentioning her growth spurts and good grades, but seldom mentioned Kate. When I asked, how is Kate doing? Kelly's reluctant answers led me to strongly suspect that Kate was somewhat neglected by her parents, though I couldn't be certain. However, when I visited my daughter's home for the twins' birthday celebration, the scene I witnessed deeply shocked me. Mina was in a dazzling luxurious dress, surrounded by her parents with bright smiles as they surrounded the cake. In contrast, Kate was wearing her usual simple, unadorned clothes. Seeing Kate quietly drinking juice in a corner of the dining room, the stark contrast in their treatment pained my heart. Why? Isn't today supposed to celebrate Kate's birthday too? I was momentarily puzzled by this unexpected situation and lost for words. Then, Mina, with a big slice of cake on a plate, walked over to Kate, offering it gently. Sister, would you like some cake? However, seeing this, my daughter and her husband quickly said, that's for Mina, you don't need to give it to her, stopping Mina. Mina looked puzzled by their reaction and Kate's face fell with disappointment and sadness. My heart boiled with anger at this series of events. What in the world is this? It's heartbreaking to see Kate treated this way. I confronted my daughter and her husband strongly, but they ignored my anger as if it were nothing. Mom, thank you for coming on such a special day. Actually, we have some wonderful news to share. And what's that news? Actually, while Mina was shopping the other day, she was approached by a talent agency. She revealed surprising news about Mina. Apparently, while enjoying their shopping, a talent scout directly. It's rare to find such an attractive child. Would you consider letting us nurture her talents for the entertainment world at our academy? And thus, a path into showbiz was offered to Mina. The specific talent academy instructor, who has discovered numerous young talents in the past and introduced them to the entertainment world as idols or actors, claimed to have a rich network within the industry. This makes it relatively easy for graduates to enter showbiz. Should I really believe that story? I questioned the veracity of that story to my daughter. It's absolutely true. They immediately recognized Mina's hidden talent. Emphasizing her trust in their assessment. But, is Kate not participating in the Talent Academy? Unfortunately, Kate doesn't have that special quality needed to succeed in showbiz. Spending money on the Academy would just be a waste. I've kept this to myself for a long time, 
but it's clear to me now that your attitude towards Kate is outright cold. Even from today's behavior, it's obvious she's not treated equally within the family. Don't you think that's truly unfair? Well, it can't be helped. Kate doesn't have the refined beauty that Mina possesses. We have to accept the facts. Honestly, Kate doesn't have any outstanding talents or characteristics either. Just look at Kate. She has countless wonderful qualities. Recently, she won a prize in a local art competition, her handwriting is envied by everyone. And above all, if I'm even slightly unwell, she's the first to worry and come to help, such a compassionate and kind child. Being good at drawing or having slightly neat handwriting, how much will that really help in the future? I'm convinced that someone as lovely and charming as Mina has a much more promising future. The truth might be hard for you to understand, but raising twins comes with more financial burden than you'd imagine. In such a situation, it only makes sense to prioritize supporting the more attractive Mina. Hearing their cold comments, I felt deep sadness but still tried to show them a path to improvement. Actually, I've been secretly saving money for a long time, so I could support my granddaughters if they ever faced a big challenge in the future. There's no need to withhold affection from Kate for economic reasons, because this fund can assist in times of need. My suggestion lit up my daughter and her husband's eyes as if they had found a treasure. Really? Could you provide us with that savings right now? Well, that savings was specifically for emergencies. For example, to be used when the girls are advancing in their education or taking a significant step forward. So, I hadn't planned on handing it over immediately. That won't do. No one can predict when an unforeseen event will occur. That's why it's necessary always to have sufficient funds on hand. Exactly. Considering our daughter's future, please, we ask for your financial support. Understood. However, I ask that this money be used equally and strategically for both of our granddaughters. With that, I handed them a debit card. However, this decision would soon become a regret. It happened a while after that event, on a harsh winter day. The cold of midwinter was severe, snow had accumulated outside, and I, disliking the cold, was sleeping wrapped in a warm blanket. Suddenly, the house's doorbell rang loudly. Who could it be at this late hour? Wondering yet, I opened the front door to find an unbelievable sight. Kate, what happened? There stood Kate, shivering. She was without an umbrella or warm clothing, covered in snow. Due to the cold, her skin was pale, almost to the point of seeming to collapse. When I asked, Kate replied in a barely audible, small voice, her teeth chattering. Please let me stay at Grandma's house. Kate. To utter such heavy words at only five years old, she must be facing quite harsh treatment in her home. From Kate's urgent appearance and words, I felt a strong compassion for her and a fierce anger towards my daughter and her husband. There's absolutely no need for you to be put through such a tough situation, you can live here safely and comfortably. I kindly spoke to her and warmly welcomed Kate into our home. Immediately, I prepared a warm bath for her to relax. Concerned about leaving Kate alone, I decided to bathe with her. However, seeing my granddaughter's body in the bath, I was once again deeply shocked. Kate was so thin that her bones were protruding, and her body clearly showed signs of being subjected to violence. What in the world is this? When I asked Kate, she answered while holding back tears. My daughter and her husband had been providing Mina with nutrient-rich, well-balanced meals as the secret to beauty, while asserting to Kate, we have no money to spend on you, giving her only leftovers to eat. When Kate, hungry, cried out, they would tell her to be quiet, sometimes even raising their hand to her. What on earth is going on? 
Not providing your child with proper nutrition and raising a hand to them is utterly unacceptable. After the bath, I used what was left in the fridge to prepare a nutritious meal for Kate. Though it was a simple meal made in haste, Kate, probably very hungry, ate everything with sparkling eyes. Grandma, I'm really thankful for today. I wish days like this could continue. After finishing dinner, Kate fell asleep contentedly in the bed I had prepared with care. Watching her peaceful sleeping face, I felt a bit relieved but also increasingly angry at my daughter and her husband. Whether it be my daughter or her spouse, I could not forgive their actions. Especially after I had given them the card specifically for Kate's sake. This led me to wonder, what has happened to the balance on that debit card? Upon checking the account of the reluctantly given debit card, I discovered a shocking withdrawal of $10,000. How could such a large amount be spent so quickly? There's no indication they're thinking of Kate, nor is it a time for extraordinary expenses. Suspicious, I decided to withdraw the remaining balance on the card. The next day, Kelly called me in a rush. Mom, all the money is gone from the account, what happened? More importantly, why did you leave Kate behind? She came here last night, shivering from the cold. Yes, about the move, I regret not informing you in advance. After discussing it with my husband, we decided moving closer to the idle training school was the best option. So, we thought Kate could stay with you. Why make such a decision? I told you Kate deserves love too. Yet, you sent her to me without a word. And what did you use the money for? I saw $10,000 missing from the account yesterday. That money was necessary for the idle training school. The lesson fees are expensive, and we couldn't afford to take care of Kate anymore. That's why we asked you to take care of her. How can you so easily give up on your own child? After my speechless moment, Kelly, misunderstanding my silence, suggested. If that's disagreeable, we could consider other facilities. I could never do such a thing. I can't believe you could be so cold to your own child. That's exactly why I withdrew all the balance from the card. So it was you who withdrew the money from the card. But why would you do that? Because it seemed the money wasn't being used properly. I had hoped that fund would be used for Kate's sake, for her happiness. But that's wrong. I need that money back right now. Suddenly, over the phone, Kelly said, let's discuss this matter in detail at your house later, and hung up. I sighed deeply and decided to wait for the weekend. As planned, Kelly and her husband came to my house with Mina. Kate was there too, but they showed no interest in her, pressing me directly instead. Please, return that money. Even if I return the money, what exactly do you plan to use it for? You do understand I won't allow it to be used for the idle training school expenses, right? In that case, I'll use it for Mina's education, like her school fees. Would that be satisfactory? Disappointed yet curious, I asked one last question. So, there's no portion of that money meant for Kate, is there? Because you'll be taking care of Kate from now on. Exactly. Kate is no longer our concern. Hearing their words, I sighed heavily. Then, I'll formally adopt Kate. That's fine with you, isn't it? Initially surprised by my proposition, they soon showed unmistakable joy. Is that true? Then we can focus everything on Mina. Their reaction revealed a complete absence of affection or concern for Kate. I'm truly grateful, Mom. Without Kate, we can spend more on Mina. Now we can make her a top idol. In front of my excited daughter, I merely changed the subject. There was this news today. I quietly took out my smartphone and showed them a news article on the screen. 
Their smiles vanished, replaced by shock, upon seeing the article. It reported the arrest of an instructor from Mina's Idol Training School on suspicion of fraud. The instructor had been approaching children in the street, tricking parents into paying high tuition fees. Despite boasting about turning many children into stars and having strong connections in the entertainment industry, it was all a lie. He had scammed large sums of money across the country before disappearing. No way. After paying $20,000 to the school, to end up like this. They convinced us that investment would bring great returns, but it was all lies. So, you essentially wasted the money. They glared at me with anger in their eyes. It was a mistake to trust you with the money. I won't be giving you any more. But what about Mina? Can't you cooperate a little more for her sake? I will be taking care of both grandchildren from now on, including Mina. Don't worry. Surprise and skepticism crossed their faces. Are you really planning to take away our beloved daughter? While we understand the situation with Kate, we've been giving all our love to Mina. True affection? Is what you're doing to Mina what you call love? The day after Kate arrived at our home, she confided in me that although Mina is loved by her parents, their version of love hasn't been bringing her happiness. Mina was being forced to practice dancing and singing against her will, pushed into becoming an idol. Despite repeatedly expressing her true feelings to her parents, they had decided, becoming an idol is the best for Mina. Moreover, Mina's days were filled with practice for her idol activities, modeling, and learning foreign languages, leaving her no free time to play. I can't take it anymore. I want time to have fun with friends and do what I like. Mina tearfully appealed to her parents, but Kelly and her husband insisted. Quitting now would mean all the money we've spent so far would go to waste. Keep at it until you become an idol. They were forcing Mina into an unbearable situation. Witnessing Mina's suffering, Kate was deeply pained and cried. Kate, knowing her sister is loved, still shows kindness and concern for her. What about you as her parents? My stern look clearly unsettled Kelly and her husband. They desperately asked Mina. Tell grandma she's lying. You do want to become an idol, right? You want to stay with us, don't you? However, Mina quietly shook her head, signaling her decision. I don't want to dance anymore. I'm not even thinking about becoming an idol. And, mom and dad, who raised their hand to my sister and abandoned her, scare me. Her words completely shook Kelly and her husband. Do you even understand how much money we've spent on you? Without a word of thanks. Kelly was about to raise her hand to Mina when someone entered the room. Police. The sudden appearance of the police officer startled Kelly and her husband. Police? Why are you here? I called them. I reported to the police about you raising your hand to Kate. The day after Kate came to my house, I took her to the hospital for an examination. The doctor diagnosed her with malnutrition and suspected abuse, prompting me to immediately report to the police. The officers acted swiftly, handcuffing Kelly and her husband right away. Wait, let us go. We haven't done anything wrong. Mom, I can't believe you'd report us to the police. While my daughter continued to shout, I calmly responded. The truly awful deed was sacrificing your children's happiness for your own benefit. That crime is serious, and you should pay for it. Then, the excited state of Kelly and her husband was quickly ended as the police officer led them away from the scene. Due to the violence and malnutrition Kate suffered, Kelly and her husband were legally found guilty and are currently serving time in prison. During that time, I received a letter from Kelly asking me to take care of them after their release, 
which I tore up. I have no intention of returning to our old relationship and have moved to start a new life with my grandchildren. Now, Kate and Mina are officially my children, and we live together. They enjoy warm meals every day, play with friends after school and on weekends, leading a healthy life. Seeing their happiness and increased smiles compared to before brings me profound joy. My greatest wish is for their happiness to last forever. Around 3 a.m. I was awakened by a sudden knocking at the door. Grandma, it's me. Can you open the door? The voice belonged to my daughter's son, Ren. Grandma, mom has gone somewhere. Despite being just five years old, Ren conveyed this with an anxious expression. What happened? Where is your mom? Did you tell your dad? I couldn't hide my concern as I asked, but my grandson shook his head in denial. Dad took mom away while she was sleeping. Really? Hearing this, I was immobilized by shock. I had sensed that my daughter and her husband, Nate, were not getting along well lately, but I had not imagined the situation was this serious. Could Nate's actions have been more dangerous than I thought? I encountered an unbelievable scene when I went to look for my daughter. I, Tammy, am in my late 50s. Although I live a little distance away from my daughter's family, it's close enough to visit on foot, and we often meet to talk about daily matters. Lately, I had noticed that my daughter, and, seemed downcast. When I asked her about it with concern, and finally opened up. I've been having troubles with Nate. Nate, my son-in-law, has been incredibly busy lately, working late every night and scarcely at home on weekends. The decrease in family conversations has left Anne and Ren feeling lonely. So, Nate is that busy? It sounds tough, but are you okay? I continued the conversation with Anne, showing my concern. Being busy is understandable, but it must feel lonely. Facing my daughter's emotional burden, I suggested. It's important to face Nate and make time to discuss your feelings. To this suggestion, my daughter pondered for a moment before quietly agreeing. Maybe you're right. I should talk to him. At that time, we couldn't have imagined that this minor worry would escalate into a much larger problem. One day, I decided to visit my daughter and her husband's home. When I rang the doorbell, my daughter greeted me with a smile, but I sensed a tension behind it, as if she was hiding something. Is something bothering you? You seem different than usual. I gently inquired, and my daughter responded. It's nothing big. Don't worry. Her reaction left me with doubts. Don't hesitate to talk if something is up. While we were talking, my son-in-law, Nate, appeared with Ren. Maybe it's the heat causing summer fatigue. I'm sure she'll be better once summer is over. Although Nate spoke cheerfully, Ron mentioned something significant. Mom and Dad have been arguing a lot lately. This statement surprised me, and I asked in astonishment. Is that true? Nate appeared flustered as he tried to explain. I'm sorry, my work has been keeping me from spending enough time at home. I understand you're busy, but it's important to make time for family. Though Nate nodded, Anne's expression remained somber. Sensing something was amiss and taking advantage of Nate stepping away for a moment, I decided to ask my daughter more pressing questions with deep concern. Looking seriously, I asked my daughter with concern. And, are you sure there's nothing wrong? If you're troubled by something, please tell me. After a moment of hesitation, my daughter, and answered with a gloomy look. I can't talk about it right now. I'll tell you when we meet again. I wanted to know what was on my daughter's mind, but I didn't want to pressure her, so I decided to leave the conversation for another time. I'm always here for you, so don't worry. I said, trying to offer encouragement. 
My daughter only nodded quietly in response. The next day, I was awakened in the middle of the night by sudden knocking at the door. Looking at the clock, it was pointing at 3 a.m. Who could it be at this hour? I wondered, feeling anxious as I headed to the front door. My heart raced as I heard a voice from outside. Grandma, it's me, Ren. Can you open the door? Hearing the voice, I was stunned. Ren, why are you here at this time of night? Are you okay? I hurried to open the door, and there stood my young grandson, Ren, trying to hold back tears. Ren, what happened? Why are you here at this time? Where are your mom and dad? Grandma, mom has disappeared. What do you mean, disappeared? Since when? Mom has been gone for a little while now. Did mom leave the house? What did your dad say? My grandson shook his head slightly and then shared something shocking. Dad took mom away while she was sleeping. What do you mean? Hearing this, I became anxious about what might have happened between my daughter and son-in-law. According to my grandson, the previous night, and and Nate, my son-in-law, had a very intense argument. However, at a certain point, Anne's voice suddenly stopped being heard. Concerned, my grandson went to check and witnessed Nate carrying Anne out of the house. Initially, my grandson thought Nate was just trying to put a sleeping Anne back to bed. But in reality, Nate carried her outside, placed her in the car, and drove off somewhere. This meant that Nate had taken away and while she was asleep. For what purpose? Anxiety swirled in my mind. I immediately tried to contact my daughter and son-in-law's mobile phones, but there was no response. At a loss for what to do, an idea suddenly came to me, and I asked my grandson. Do you know of any place they often visit or any place that comes to mind? After thinking hard, my grandson recalled an important piece of information. When dad was carrying mom to the car, I think he mumbled something about a mountain. The word mountain made my heart even heavier. Then, wait here for me. I said, leaving my grandson at home as I rushed towards the mountains in my car with a sense of urgency. Arriving at the mountain parking area, I took a flashlight in hand and began searching the dark mountain paths with apprehension. After a while of searching, I thought I heard a human voice faintly. Heading in the direction of the voice, I saw something moving in the bushes. I quickly made my way to the spot. Anne. Anne. What I found was my daughter, and lying down. Her complexion was deathly pale, her breathing was very weak, and her body felt as cold as ice when I lifted her. Why here? Could this be Nate's doing? It was a bitterly cold winter day, and the place where my daughter was found was secluded. If I hadn't found her by chance, and might have frozen to death. Anger swirled within me at the thought of my son-in-law creating such a situation. I hurriedly called for an ambulance and rushed my continuously unconscious daughter to the hospital. Thankfully, because I found my daughter in time, her life was not in danger, and she was just in a weakened state. However, the doctor, after examining my daughter, told me with a serious expression. Your daughter has an excessive amount of sleeping pills in her system. Shocked and frightened by the doctor's words, I shuddered at the thought that my son-in-law might have given them to her. The next day, and finally woke up in the hospital bed. Where am I? Why am I here? I tried to explain the series of events that had occurred as calmly as possible. After my explanation, my daughter was silent for a while before speaking with a pained expression. Nate must have brought me to this mountain to abandon me. Her voice was filled with disappointment and despair. She then began to detail her attempts to discuss their issues, as I had previously suggested. Nate has been so busy with work recently, barely home on weekends, that I tried to talk to him about it. 
When and questioned Nate about his grueling work schedule, he responded irritably. That's the company policy. It's the rule, so there's nothing I can change. But is it really that harsh? Maybe you should consider changing jobs if that's true. Nate's irritation grew at Anne's suggestion. How many times do I have to say it? I'm working for the family. So stop complaining. He shouted and then locked himself in his room. Despite Anne's repeated attempts to talk, Nate continued to avoid the conversation. Feeling that the issue wouldn't be resolved this way, and boldly decided to call Nate's workplace directly. The person who answered was Nate's direct supervisor. That's strange. He always leaves on time, and we don't have weekend work in our department. And was puzzled by a reality completely different from what her husband had described. That night, when Nate returned home late, and confronted him for confirmation, and he exploded in anger. Leave me alone. It's not okay to contact my boss without my permission. He raised his voice in anger and continued to lash out at Anne. And, having serious doubts, questioned Nate. I may have been wrong to call your boss without asking. But what I really want to know is what you were actually doing during those overtime hours. Nate was clearly rattled and became visibly angry at the question. Shut up. Why does that matter? Saying this, he stormed off to his room. Doubting his reaction and decided to secretly investigate Nate's actions by hiring a detective and also discreetly installed a voice recorder in the car. About a week later, the detective's report shattered Anne's heart. It revealed that Nate was having an affair with a junior colleague from his company, heading to her house after work. Moreover, they spent weekends together at amusement parks and cinemas. The busy work was all a lie, he was actually spending his holidays with her. And, who had endured believing it was for the family, was deeply shocked by this reality. The voice recorder in the car captured astonishing conversations between Nate and his mistress. This is my son. Isn't he cute? He really is cute. I hope to become his mom someday. Nate showed a picture of his son to his mistress, and she showed interest in it. You should divorce your wife soon. I want to. If you can become my son's mother, then I don't need my wife anymore. Hearing this conversation, Anne was heartbroken by her husband's deep betrayal. On the voice recorder, Nate shared his concerns about divorce with his mistress. The problem is, even if I want to divorce, it's complicated. Custody would almost certainly go to my wife. That's the reality. Then why not make it seem like your wife is at fault? Like she's cheating or neglecting the child? Though he chuckled, Nate wasn't keen on the idea. But my wife isn't like that. If only she could just disappear from this world, everything would be resolved. Anne felt deep sorrow and shock knowing her husband wished she would vanish. Especially since this conversation was what she heard just before I visited, and she had been carrying the shock when she met me. Hearing my words of being her ally and decided to confront her husband. That night, after their son quietly fell asleep and presented the evidence of his affair and demanded the truth. What is this? Why do you have this? While Nate was flustered, Anne responded calmly. I can't believe you've been having an affair. We can't be together anymore. I want a divorce. Panicking, Nate desperately argued. Wait, what about our son? I'll take custody of Ren. I won't let him stay with you. Nate begged. I can't bear to be separated from my son. Please, find a way. And firmly stated. My mind is made up. I can't be with you anymore. Her words showed her despair and determination against her husband. Nate tried to persuade and several times, 
but her resolve was firm, and her rejection unchanged. After a long back and forth, Nate finally accepted the situation. I guess I have no choice but to accept it. Saying so, Nate went to the kitchen and started preparing a late-night snack for the two of them. I'm hungry. Let's have something to eat. He calmly made barley tea and toast, encouraging Anne to eat as well. Initially hesitant, and eventually partook in the meal provided by her husband. But soon after, she was suddenly overcome with drowsiness. Sorry, but I can't stand being separated from my son. As her consciousness faded, and heard her husband say those words. Learning of this incident, was trembling with rage. To think that Nate would abandon and in the mountains. Concerned for her grandson's safety, I reassured Anne. Don't worry. Ren is safely with me at my house. After reassuring Anne, I took her to the hospital. There, mother and child had an emotional reunion, and Anne embraced her son tightly. Witnessing this, I could finally breathe a sigh of relief. Later, when checking my smartphone, I found several messages from Nate. Where is Run? I've searched the entire house, and he's nowhere to be found. Nate's messages seemed to conceal panic and anxiety. Upon seeing these messages, I was once again struck by the gravity of the situation. It seems that after executing his cold-hearted plan, my son-in-law returned home as if nothing had happened. In response to his urgent messages, I suppressed my anger and calmly replied, Ren is safe with me. We're at the hospital because we're concerned about Anne. Nate quickly replied, seeming confused, why are you all at the hospital? What's happening with and right now? Hesitating for a moment on how to respond, and, who had been closely following our exchange, spoke up. Please tell Nate that I've left this world. Taking her request to heart, I replied with a heavy heart, unfortunately, Anne has passed away. It seems she froze to death in the mountains. She might have been struggling with the pressures of motherhood. Sending this message, we were filled with anger, even though you left her there. Time passed, and eventually, Nate showed up in Anne's hospital room. Why isn't she in the morgue? Confused, he entered the room, stunned to find and sitting on the bed. I can't believe you're still alive. Nate stated, incredulous. To which Anne responded calmly yet firmly. You must be disappointed. But, I'm still here. Her words only deepened Nate's confusion. I was sure you wouldn't survive in that freezing mountain. He said, half in disbelief, but Anne cut him off, not concealing her anger and disappointment. My mother saved my life. If she had been any later, I might not be in this world anymore. Your actions are what put me in that dangerous situation. Her calm yet resolute response left my son-in-law glaring at me in fury. You shouldn't have meddled. I emphasized the value of my daughter's life and countered calmly. How is saving my daughter's life unnecessary? What is more important than saving her life? Left speechless by our conversation, my son-in-law could find no words to retaliate. Amid the tense atmosphere, Ran, who had been quietly listening, spoke up to my son-in-law in a soft voice. I was the one who told Grandma. That mom was missing. Grateful for Ren's brave action, I continued towards my son-in-law. Exactly. Ren came to my house alone in the middle of the night. Can you imagine how much courage that took? My words left my son-in-law unable to hide his astonishment. I can't believe Ren went out in the middle of the night. But that's too dangerous. As my son-in-law began to scold Ren, I calmly explained to him. True, going out at night is dangerous, but the situation that led to it was created by your actions. Can you comprehend how Ren felt coming to my house? 
At those words, my son-in-law had nothing to say in return. And to my son-in-law's stunned silence, and made a firm declaration. I said it last night, but I'll make it clear again. We are getting divorced. I can no longer be by your side. These words visibly shook my son-in-law, who hurriedly objected. Wait. I'm Ren's father. You can't separate us. It's true that you are Ren's father, but I can no longer be with someone who neglects others like you do. It's not safe for Ron to be around you either. To these words, my son-in-law desperately tried to justify his actions. My intentions were simple. I thought if you were gone, Ren and I could start a new life. I never meant to hurt Ren. He said this in a faint voice and then turned to his son with a hopeful question. Ren, you don't want to be away from your dad, right? However, my grandson answered in a calm voice. I'm okay, as long as I have mom and grandma. Dad, you abandoned mom, so I don't like you. My son-in-law could not hide his disturbance at Ren's clear response. No. Ren. He said in a voice filled with agony and firmly grasped Ren's shoulder. Dad, that hurts. Let go. My grandson struggled to escape my son-in-law's grip, but it was strong. Nate. What are you doing to run? Let him go right now. I also forcefully urged my son-in-law to stop. Nate, stop it. What are you thinking, causing your grandson such pain? At that moment, several police officers rushed into the hospital room. Nate Smith, you are under arrest. Instantly, Nate's expression filled with surprise and fear. What are you talking about? He yelled, but the officers swiftly handcuffed him. I've reported the whole incident to the police. You are being arrested on suspicion of attempted murder against your wife. I informed him calmly, causing Nate to pale and lose his words. No, this can't be happening. Despite his struggles, the officers restrained him and led him out of the room. Throughout the thorough police interrogation, my son-in-law eventually had no choice but to admit to his plotted scheme. Anne's ex-husband, Nate, after being exposed for his affair, fearing separation from his son, secretly mixed sleeping pills into Anne's dinner. Confirming that Anne had fallen into a deep sleep, he then transported her to the cold mountains, hoping she would freeze to death. However, I found Anne in time, preventing the plan from being completed. After the incident, Nate was arrested by the police for attempted murder and faced legal charges. And finalized her divorce from Nate and filed for damages against him and his mistress. The mistress's affair became public, losing her job and position, leading her to resign. It remains unknown where she is now. The trial moved swiftly, resulting in Nate being found guilty of attempted murder. While he served his sentence, and received letters from him expressing regret and a desire to see her and their son upon release. And, however, tore the letters up immediately. Just remembering what he did brings back the fear. I can never meet him again. Hearing this, I pondered over how to ensure and could live in peace. After a thorough discussion, we decided to move without informing Nate, starting anew with her son. They now live days filled with peace and tranquility, free from any contact with Nate. To Anne's delight, she recently decided to remarry a man who is genuinely kind and understanding, loving her son as his own. The son affectionately calls him dad, embracing him wholeheartedly. I deeply hope this marriage brings true happiness to Anne and her son. I'm going to remarry a wealthy doctor, so you'll need to take care of the twins. Saying this, my daughter-in-law Alara laughed mockingly. The man standing next to her also wore a nasty grin. 
There was no way I could leave the adorable twins with these two. Really? I'd be delighted to look after them. If I can take care of these kids, I'm happy to do it. With that thought, I responded with a smile. But please, never show your face to us or the kids ever again. Fine by me. I have no interest in those kids anyway. Laughing, Alara left. As I glared at Alara's retreating figure, the twins ran up to me. Can we stay here? Yes, of course. Let's live together with Grandma from today. I want to live with Grandma. Holding them tight, I swore in my heart to make them happy. Fifteen years passed in the blink of an eye. Living a peaceful life, someone came to me. Hey! Give me back my twins! My name is Corinne, a 60-year-old housewife who works in a factory. I have a son, Dexter, and my husband who passed away a few years ago. My husband's family has been running a factory, and I met him at that factory. When I was working diligently, he approached me, and we fell in love instantly. After a few years of dating, we got married and had Dexter. I dream of taking over Dad's factory when I grow up. So, I want to learn everything I can. Dexter got his kindness from my husband and his seriousness from me, and he's turned out to be a great kid. Having been around the factory from a young age, he was adored by everyone there. After graduating middle school, I want to work in the factory. What? What are you saying? Thanks to this, Dexter was respected by everyone working in the factory and even wanted to work right after middle school at one point. Moreover, our factory is large and contracts with several major companies, ensuring a substantial income. Dexter is also academically gifted, so he could aim for a prestigious university. As parents, we hoped he would at least graduate from college. We'd really like you to go to college first. No, I want to start working in the factory as soon as possible. No matter how much we tried to persuade him, Dexter was adamant and wouldn't listen. What to do? Just when I was pondering this, someone else persuaded him. Dexter. You should go to college. He was Leon, who joined our factory right after high school. He and Dexter were close in age and often spent time together. You need to learn what I couldn't, make the factory bigger, and let its name be known overseas with your own hands. Because these words came from him, Dexter listened carefully and eventually went to college. Dexter, having studied business in college, brought new contracts and further expanded the factory's performance. I believed we could all manage the factory and live happily ever after. But then, suddenly, my husband fell ill and collapsed at the factory. He never regained consciousness and passed away there. From now on, I'll protect both the factory and you, Mom. Amidst everyone's sorrow, Dexter, having grown up, supported me and firmly managed the factory as well. He, now happily married, is the father of his twin girls, Sienna and Avalon. Grandma! We came to visit. I'm so glad you both came. Take your time and relax. Both twins are adorable, Sienna, the elder, is serious, while Avalon, the younger, is very kind. They both adore me and cling to me whenever they visit. Their presence is so endearing to me, it helps distract me from the grief of losing my husband. Mom, how long do you plan to keep working? I intend to work as long as possible. I don't want to be a burden to you or your family in the future. That's why I'm still actively working at the factory. Thanks to that, my days are fulfilling. It's nice to take it easy once in a while. One day, on my day off. I was planning to enjoy some reading today, taking a break from the factory. Oh, who could that be? Suddenly, the doorbell rang, 
and with no visitors expected, I checked the camera, puzzled. Eh? Sienna? Avalon? The visitors were the twins. Surprised, I immediately opened the door and welcomed them inside. What's the matter, you two? Where's your mom? Looking around, there was no sign of any adults. Could it be that these five-year-old children came here alone? With that thought, I decided to ask the twins. Mom said today we should go to Grandma's house. Mom said she's too busy to take care of us today. Upon further inquiry, it turned out that Alara, the twins' mother and Dexter's wife, had told them to go to my house and locked them out. It was a chilly day with light snowfall, and the outside was very cold. Even though our houses are within walking distance, to have children walk alone is unthinkable. You must be cold. I'll make you some warm cocoa right away. I love cocoa. Thank you, Grandma. While serving the twins warm drinks, I decided to call Alara. However, she showed no sign of answering her phone. So, I decided to contact Dexter instead. What? Sienna and Avalon are there? Dexter, immediately answering the phone, was surprised when I explained the situation. He had been away on a business trip for the past week and was not at home. He was supposed to return today but wouldn't make it until the evening. I'd rush over right now if I could, but I'm still on the business trip and it looks impossible. Could you please look after them until I get there? Yes, of course, that's not a problem at all. Dexter apologized for the imposition, so I readily agreed. Having had no plans for the day, and the prospect of spending it with the adorable twins made me very happy. Thank you. I'll leave them in your care then. I'll also try to contact Alara from my end. After hanging up with Dexter, I felt the twins' gazes on me, looking somewhat anxious. Let's play together until your dad comes. Can you tell me what games you like to play? I'm so happy to play with Grandma. I want to play video games. After that, we spent some time playing video games with the twins. Then, Dexter contacted me. Alara seems to have her phone turned off. I can't get in touch with her either. I see. Don't worry, I'll take good care of the twins, so take your time coming here. That really helps. Thanks, Mom. After hanging up, I sighed. What could Alara be doing? It would be good if we could contact her family at a time like this. According to Dexter, she's estranged from her own family. That's why she hardly ever contacts them. So, her family might not know what's going on with her. Hey, what does your mom usually do? Have you heard anything? Thinking this was the only way, I decided to ask the twins. She's not interested in us. She has someone more important than us. Hearing their words, I had a bad feeling. Could it be that Alara is having an affair? Maybe I should have it investigated. While thinking about this, I made sure to keep the twins entertained so they wouldn't worry. Sorry to keep you waiting, and thanks for looking after them. Dad's here. Welcome back, Dad. A few hours later, Dexter came to pick them up. Seeing their father, the twins ran to him happily. Watching this scene made me feel better, but Dexter looked tired. Did you manage to get in touch with Alara? No, not yet. Actually, I've been thinking about what to do next. He said this as if weighed down by heavy thoughts. Depending on Alara's response, I might come back home with the twins. When that time comes, don't hesitate to come back. I gladly accepted Dexter's words. I could see Dexter's expression soften a bit. Feeling relieved yet also angry at Alara for pushing Dexter to this point.
Hours later, as it was getting late, the doorbell rang. I've come to pick up the twins. There stood Alara, twirling her brown hair, not hiding her annoyance. I couldn't help feeling irritated by her. Before I could speak. Alara! What have you been doing all this time? Alara, seeing the angry Dexter, was taken aback. Why is Dexter here? Never mind that, just answer me. I was called out by a mom friend suddenly, and we were meeting. Alara answered Dexter, clearly annoyed by the questioning. Then why didn't you contact anyone? My phone died, so it couldn't be helped. Alara kept making excuses while being questioned by Dexter. Dexter sighed deeply. Sorry for the trouble. Let's go home. Dexter apologized to me and left with the twins, who were clearly unhappy. The next day. Oh, this is unusual. I was a bit surprised, but answered the phone when Alara called. Really, Corinne? Because of your meddling, Dexter scolded me. Yes. If you had just kept quiet and looked after the twins, none of this would have happened. Alara started complaining before I could even get a word in. I was taken aback for a moment, but, of course, I retorted. First of all, it's your fault for locking out the twins, isn't it? And if you wanted me to look after them, you should have contacted me in advance. It was good that I was home this time. But if I had been out, those kids might have been freezing in the cold. What? Are you talking back? This is why I can't stand old people. Annoyed by my words, Alara said this and then hung up. I wonder what she is thinking. Annoyed by her attitude, I let out a deep sigh. Then the phone rang again, and it was Leon's name on the display. Actually, I went on a trip, and I'd like to give you a souvenir. Are you free later? Oh, that's lovely. I'm free, so please come over anytime. Leon has always been fond of me like a mother. He started working at our factory after his parents died in a car accident when he was in high school. Since his parents were colleagues, I looked after him. Dexter also adored him like a brother. May I come in? Corinne, you seem tired. What's wrong? As soon as Leon arrived, he looked concerned and asked me. Yes, a little. Would you mind listening to what happened? No, of course not. So, I decided to vent to Leon. He listened to me attentively, nodding at the right moments. That's concerning. After hearing me out, Leon started to ponder. I know a detective. I'll ask if they can investigate this for us. Really? That would be a relief. It's fine. You're like a mother to me, and Dexter is like a brother. So, the twins are like my nieces. I'd do anything for such important family. Leon said this with a smile, which made him seem very reliable. This happened a few days ago. Mom, could you look after the twins this coming Saturday? Dexter asked me with a voice that sounded tense. Curious about his tone, I agreed. On the day, he arrived with a determined look and the twins, who were sleepy because it was early in the morning. Dexter, what's wrong? Did something happen? I couldn't help but ask. I'll tell you everything when I get back. Be good, okay? Smiling at the twins, he left. I watched him go until he was out of sight, believing he would surely come back. Dad's gone, isn't he? Will Dad come back soon? Yes. He'll surely come back soon. But Dexter never returned. What? No, that can't be. Is that really true about Dexter? 
Dexter had been in a traffic accident and never came back. Things were tough after that. Please, tell me it's a lie. Daddy! Daddy! Wake up, Daddy. Having lost Dexter, the twins and I could only cry as we held his cold body. Why? Leaving behind such cute kids. It's too soon. Leon supported us through it all and took care of various arrangements. The factory workers rushed over too, and everyone consoled us. But... What is she doing? Her husband has just died suddenly. Alara was nowhere to be seen during all this. Even after the funeral was over, there was no contact from her, and she had vanished. Maybe it's better she's not here. I was angry at her actions. But, if she's not here, there's no need to get irritated by her disrespectful behavior. Thinking this, I looked after the crying twins, struggling to recover. Eventually, when we started to find our calm, the doorbell rang. Oh, who could that be? Checking the camera to see who it was, Alara was there. Alara. What have you been doing all this time? Oh, hello. It's been a while. Opening the door in anger, there stood Alara with a flashy dressed man. I had a bad feeling about this. And with that thought, my anger turned to calmness. What do you want now? After all this time, how can you even show your face? Oh, scary. This is my boyfriend. He's a wealthy doctor. My cold attitude didn't matter to her. Alara boasted about the man next to her with a graceless smile. You were cheating on Dexter, weren't you? It's not cheating. He's the one for me. Saying this, Alara and the man beside her laughed together. Actually, I came to ask you for a favor, Corinne. What is it now? The twins would be in the way of my remarriage, so I don't need them. I want you to take them. At her words, my anger reached its limit. Alara just said what? Did she just say she doesn't need her daughters, whom she gave birth to? Flooded with these thoughts, I was at a loss for words. Since I'm marrying a wealthy doctor, it's better if the old lady takes care of the twins. Laughing mockingly, Alara looked at me. The man beside her also smirked, sharing in the laughter. I couldn't possibly leave my precious grandchildren with such people. What? Really? I'd be delighted. If I'm being entrusted with this, I'm happy to take care of it. Thinking so, I responded with a smile. However, please never appear before me or the children again. That's fine. I'm not interested in those kids anyway. Saying this, Alara laughed mockingly as she left. As I glared at her retreating figure, the twins ran up to me. Can we stay here? Yes, of course. Let's live together with Grandma starting today. I want to live with Grandma. To think she didn't want these adorable twins. While hugging them, I swore in my heart to make them happy. Grandma, we'll come home early today. We'll make dinner, so wait for us. Yes, I understand. And just like that, 15 years flew by. Having quit my job, I sent off the twins as they left the house. Since then, I've managed to recover and was living a normal life. Well, what shall I do today? Just as I was enjoying a peaceful life, someone came to visit. Being quite old now, I was spending my time leisurely without overexerting myself. The doorbell rang. I wonder who it could be. Open up! You have two people inside, don't you? When I asked the visitor through the camera, she didn't answer my question and kept yelling. It appeared to be a woman, but I didn't recognize her. Wondering who it could be. 
Hey! Give me back my twins! Hearing those words, I realized who the woman was. Alara had aged and looked worn out over the last 15 years. So much so that I couldn't recognize her at first. This is too much for me alone to handle. Muttering so, I contacted someone, Leon, and the factory employees. They gathered within minutes. What are you doing here now? The first to get angry was Leon. He glared at Alara with a furious look. What do you mean? I'm just here to take back my daughters. Startled by Leon's fervor, Alara retorted defiantly, despite being intimidated. They are my children. So give them back to me. She probably screamed because she saw them on TV. Actually, both are now sought-after celebrities, Sienna as a popular idol and Avalon as a talented actress. They were recently featured as beautiful twins, likely prompting Alara's appearance. What happened to that wealthy doctor you remarried? I asked Alara. Alara grimaced at my question. I dumped that long ago. She began to explain her situation, yelling, even though no one asked. The doctor she brought that day was a fraud. That man was only after Dexter's wealth. It looks like the man who came up to Alara was just after Dexter's big wealth, since Dexter owned a large factory. After Dexter passed away, Alara, who got his inheritance, and the man wasted it all on expensive lifestyles until the man was eventually caught and arrested. Additionally, it turned out that the man was using his brother's name as a fake name. Alara, having nothing left, abandoned her boyfriend without shame and showed up at this house. Those twins are originally my children, so I'm taking them back. There's no way I would allow that. Right. We won't let you lay a finger on them. As Leon said this, the factory employees who rushed over all shouted in agreement. Yes, those twins are precious children raised by all of us at the factory. There's not a chance we would hand them over to such a woman. On the day Alara abandoned the twins. I was prepared to raise them, but considering my age, I asked everyone at the factory for help. What a woman! That's terrible. Corinne, leave it to us. Let's raise these children together as a factory family. And so, we all united to take care of the twins. We took turns looking after them, playing with them, and going out together. Thanks to everyone's effort, the initially withdrawn twins gradually opened up. You know, we have a dream. We made a promise with Dad, too. We'll definitely make it come true. They began to talk about their dreams of becoming an idol and an actress. Hearing this, we all watched TV together, learned, and supported their singing and acting practices as much as we could. Surely, if they had stayed with Alara, they wouldn't have been able to fulfill their dreams or maybe not even been raised healthily. Thank you for letting go of them. Because of that, they were able to achieve their dreams. And now? You come back demanding them? Who do you think you are? Shut up. I'm their mother, right? Those twins have a duty to support me. Hearing Alara's words, everyone showed angry expressions. Everyone was thinking, how dare she call herself a mother? At that moment, whose mother are you saying you are? We don't have a disgusting mother like you. That's when we heard their voices. Everyone's gaze turned toward the sound. There stood the twins, looking displeased. Sienna! Avalon! It's been a while. Just like my children, you've both grown into beauties. Alara spoke to them with a beaming smile. But the twins looked even more disgusted in response. So? 
who claims to be our mother? After treating us like nuisances and locking us out in the cold? And abandoning us the moment dad was gone? The two asked coldly. Despite their young age at the time, they clearly remembered what their mother had done. Well, that's... There were circumstances. Alara was at a loss for words in response to their questions. We remember everything. How you neglected us. And betrayed dad, causing the incident that led to his disappearance. Alara was taken aback by their words. The twins knew the truth about what happened 15 years ago. Dexter had been aware of Alara's affair long before because he confronted her, who was there on a cheating trip. Alara was making excuses even then. I'm filing for divorce, and of course, I'll be seeking alimony. Disgusted, Dexter attempted to leave. However, panicked by the mention of alimony, Alara tried to grab Dexter, causing him to lose balance and step onto the road, where he was hit by a truck. How? How do you know about that? Alara's voice trembled in response. I looked into it. Leon answered. He had diligently investigated to avenge Dexter. His persistence led to finding a witness and uncovering the truth. Ideally, this should have been reported to the police, but by that time, the investigation had been closed, and there was no physical evidence. We chose to remain silent, wanting nothing more to do with Alara. We'll never forgive you, nor do we plan to support you. No way! And if you're talking about taking us back, then pay back all the child support you owe. Alara appeared flustered by their words. We were pleased to see how grown up the twins had become. So, what will you do? Or shall we call the police and have them take you away? As the twins pressed her. Don't be ridiculous! Alara ran away. You've really grown up. Well, yes. We'll make sure to pay back all the kindness we've received. Watching them, Leon seemed on the verge of tears. He had acted as a father to the twins, protecting and raising them in Dexter's stead. I was equally moved. Really, Leon, you're going to cry? Don't cry, it's embarrassing. I'm not crying yet. Leon's response triggered laughter. A warm and happy scene unfolded. I couldn't help but smile as well. A few days later. By the way, that mother who was yelling got arrested, it seems. I heard that, too. She tried to approach us again after that and the police found out her location. Oh dear. Hearing about Alara from the twins. It turned out she was arrested by the police as an accomplice of her boyfriend. Alara had called her boyfriend a fraudster, but she was involved in his schemes. They were running a scam similar to a honey trap and were being pursued by the police. Because everyone at the factory acted that day, there were many witnesses. That's why they found her so quickly. People who witnessed that day's events reported it, leading to a thorough investigation and Alara being sent to prison. Alara might claim to be the mother of the beautiful twin sisters once she's released. But such claims will only make things worse for her. She won't be getting out anytime soon. It's a relief that the police caught her. Now, you can focus on your shooting without worries. Yes! Make sure to watch it, Grandma. Of course, I'll definitely watch. It's your culmination after all. The content being filmed was about their lives. Losing their father at the age of five, abandoned by their mother simultaneously, and then raised by the people at their grandmother's factory. It was the story of how they became popular despite their circumstances. The more Lara claims to be the mother, the more people will disdain her. 
she's getting what she deserves. Let her taste her own medicine. Exactly. Plus, this broadcast will make the factory even more popular. We'll need Leon to keep working hard. Leon, who took over after Dexter, is now managing the factory. I will protect everything. Leon said, continuing to guard us. The drama that was broadcasted became a hit. People sympathized with the twins' plight and directed their disgust towards their mother. Some extreme fans looked up Alara and found out she's currently in prison. Well, she won't have anything good waiting for her once she's released then. Nobody would be waiting for Alara anymore. Even her boyfriend, involved in multiple frauds and having abandoned her once, wouldn't come to pick her up. Her parents, upon investigation, had disowned her long ago and knew nothing about her. She was too wicked, causing trouble to her family and got disowned. If only she had learned her lesson back then. Indeed. With such circumstances, no relatives will come to pick her up. She will spend her future alone, regretting her actions. I feel like I've finally avenged our loss. Leon said, looking as if a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. He had acted considering our best interests and had fought hard to protect the factory. That's why the twins regard Leon as a father figure. Truly, thank you for everything. At my words, Leon laughed bashfully. Actually, Corinne, I have something to discuss with you. Oh, what is it? I've been thinking about leaving the factory. I wasn't surprised by his words. I had a feeling and knew he was training a younger person to take over. Now that the twins' dreams have come true, and I've left the factory in reliable hands, I want to pursue my own dreams. If that's what you've decided, I won't object. Thank you for everything. Smiling, I responded, and Leon smiled happily back. I visited the graves of my husband and Dexter. It's been 15 years since you've been gone. Dexter, I wonder if you're getting along with Dad over there. The time for me to join them might not be too far away. The children have grown up splendidly, achieving their dreams. Triggered by that drama, Sienna has become an even more popular idol, with a national tour planned soon. Avalon received an offer to act in an international film and has flown overseas. Dexter, your vendetta was thoroughly avenged by Leon. After leaving the factory, Leon seems to be enjoying his hobby of traveling. Everyone has grasped their dreams. So, don't worry. Just wait for me leisurely over there. Standing up, I pondered what to do next. I plan to live my life to the fullest until my time comes. Believing that's my way of repaying. Now, I should get ready for Avalon's call today. Muttering, I started walking. Grandma! Sienna? Weren't you in the middle of your national tour? I was nearby, so I thought I'd come to see you. I also want to join the video call with Avalon. Sienna said, displaying a wonderful smile. Surely, Avalon would wear the same smile. Their smiles are my source of strength, and I'll keep living on with that energy. My name is Sarah. My father, who had been fighting an illness for a long time, unfortunately passed away a few days ago. Oh, how I wish I could have shown him his grandchild a bit sooner. I often feel this way, sincerely. Memories of my wedding day come to mind. I was a bride at 25, about five years ago from now. A promise I made with my father at that time still lingers in my mind. I promised that I would be the first to tell him the news of my pregnancy. Unfortunately, I couldn't fulfill that promise. I'm left with regrets when I think of him. Dad's illness became apparent a year ago. Since then, I've tried to support him as much as I could. 
sometimes returning home and visiting the hospital with mom to see him. I also maintained communication with dad through chats and video calls. I've tried everything possible, but still, worries remain in my heart. I can't help but think, maybe I could have done a little more. When I said this, my mother next to me gently replied. Are you okay, Sarah? You really did all you could have. I'm sure dad is proud of you too. At that moment, my elder sister Emma returned home. I'm back. I've brought the lawyer with me. She says as she enters the living room. Behind my sister stood a calm-looking man in his mid-forties. Wondering if this man was the lawyer, he politely bowed his head and said, Pleased to meet you, I'm Smith. Please, this way. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Smith, the lawyer, sat down in front of us. My sister immediately began to speak. I checked with this lawyer, and it turns out dad left quite a bit of an inheritance. But, you're not going to receive everything, sis. Of course, I know that. My sister snapped at me in a bad mood. In response, I glared back at her without backing down. Our relationship was far from good. It wasn't this bad in the past. However, after dad's illness became apparent, our relationship worsened even more. One reason was my sister's haughty attitude. Despite numerous attempts to contact her, she never once visited dad. I admit that my words may have been a bit too harsh at times. Concerned for dad's well-being, I sometimes spoke to her in a slightly stronger tone. But it's partially my sister's fault as well, since she always talks back. We're not children anymore. You don't need to be so stubborn. It's not that I'm being stubborn. I live in the city, so it's not easy for me to come back home. Sure, this place is in the countryside, but it takes about an hour by train, right? That hour is a big burden. And the travel costs aren't trivial. Are you that worried about money? Of course. I'm busy, so please don't contact me anymore. She ended the conversation like that. Despite living far away, I always thought it would be nice if she occasionally came to see the family. That's why our relationship deteriorated so quickly. In the end, my sister never visited our father's sickbed, and even now there's still a hostile atmosphere between us. Perhaps sensing the tense air, the lawyer stepped in to try and ease the situation. Please, let's all try to calm down. Apologies. Well, as I mentioned over the phone, I am in possession of the deceased's will. When was that? It was a few weeks before he passed away. I received a request to draft the will over the phone. And at that time, did you visit the hospital directly? Yes, with the attending physician present, the deceased wrote the will himself. Turns out my father had arranged for his physician to contact the lawyer in case of his death. Following my father's passing, the physician contacted the lawyer, who in turn reached out to our family. That is why I contacted you all. While saying this, the lawyer took out a white envelope and placed it on the table. This is the deceased's will. This is definitely my dad's handwriting. More importantly, hurry up and tell us what's inside. I don't have much time. Then, let's open it without further ado. The lawyer opened the envelope. Inside was just a piece of paper. It contained information about my father's estate, the house and land, savings, and something about a shed. I knew about the house and land, but I was puzzled about the shed. Meanwhile, my sister asked the lawyer. There's no mention of the farmland dad owned, is there? The farmland, you say? Yes, the farmland dad tended to as a hobby. Dad used to run his own company in a neighboring town. But after turning 50, he began to feel his health decline. I'm thinking of closing the company and taking it easy from here on out. 
Is that okay with you? When I heard this, I was in high school. My sister, who was in college at the time, initially opposed the idea, but mom and I agreed that dad's health should come first. Emma, you don't need to worry about money. We have enough savings. Hearing this, my sister reluctantly agreed. As a result, dad truly did close his company and began to devote himself to growing vegetables on a small plot of land near our house. It's surprisingly fun to get moving while growing vegetables. Seeing dad talk happily about gardening, I genuinely felt happy for him. However, my sister seemed to have a different view. Despite saying she would return home after graduating college, she ended up taking a job in the city and unexpectedly married the CEO of an IT company. With this backdrop, dad immersed himself in farming until his health deteriorated. My sister is questioning why that farmland isn't included in the inheritance. When my sister made this claim, the lawyer reviewed the documents and said, Turns out the farmland was actually rented. Rented? I always thought it was a larger piece of land. My sister showed signs of disappointment. Indeed, the vegetable garden dad lovingly cared for was spacious. However, for us unfamiliar with farming, it was a challenge to manage. I felt somewhat relieved to learn it was rented. The conversation then shifted to the topic of dividing the inheritance. First, the house and its land will be inherited by your mother. Upon hearing this, a confident expression briefly appeared on my sister's face. So, we're free to divide the rest of the inheritance as we like? Exactly. The savings and the storage shed should be evenly distributed between you sisters. By savings, you mean cash, right? How much are we talking about? The total savings amount to about $100,000. You won't have to worry about inheritance tax with this amount. Then, I'll take the $100,000 in cash. My sister declared this boldly. However, her words immediately sparked resistance in me. Wait a minute, I can't agree to this division. Why not? I'm the eldest in this family. So what? What does that have to do with anything? You can have the shed. But what exactly is this shed? Emma asked Mr. Smith. He checked the documents again before answering. The shed is a small building located next to the farmland. Along with the land it's on and the items inside are part of the inheritance. And the land? Emma's eyes lit up with financial interest, and I couldn't help but smirk internally at her attitude. Then, Mr. Smith provided more details. How big is the shed? It's about the size of a small room, around 9.5 square meters. Here's a photo of it. Mr. Smith spread a photo of the shed on the table. The photo showed an old, small shed with gardening tools and shovels inside. The exterior looked like an old hut, and nothing particularly special seemed to be inside. I don't want this, it's of no use to me. Emma said discontented. I looked at the photo just like my sister and agreed that the contents were indeed nothing remarkable. As the discussion on the division of the estate continued, Emma declared firmly to me. In conclusion, I've decided to take the cash. You should take that old shed. Wait a minute. That's not a fair division. You supported the vegetable gardening, didn't you? What's the issue? I found it hard to argue against my sister's definitive statements. However, it was clear that if I said nothing, all of Dad's estate would end up with her. Let's settle it this way. Emma said, and I hesitated on how to respond. Then, our mother calmly voiced her opinion. If Emma is fine with this, I have no objections. There's no reason for any complaints. Then, let's decide, Emma gets the cash, and Sarah gets the shed. Agreed, that's settled then. 
Emma nodded in satisfaction. Feeling anxious about her demeanor, I immediately tried to protest. Wait, I'm still not convinced. Just give up already. But, that's... Do you want the cash that badly? How greedy of you. It's not like that. You're so annoying. Dad should be more important to you rather than money. I was left speechless by my sister's words. Family is indeed the top priority, but money also holds undeniable importance. However, comparing family and money seemed nonsensical to me. While I was lost in thought, my sister swiftly brought the discussion to a close. As a result, my mother inherited the house and land, and my sister got the cash dad had saved. All that was left for me was an old shed, both inside and out. After signing the inheritance documents, my sister left the house looking very pleased with herself. Watching her, I felt a deep sense of dissatisfaction inside. I expressed this dissatisfaction to my mother. Mom, why didn't you support me more? I did support you. We settled on the shed, didn't we? Is that really support? It just seems like you gave in to what my sister wanted. That's not true. I made sure you could have the shed. But what I wanted wasn't a shed like that. Maybe it'll turn out to be better than you think once you actually see it. My mother said this with a gentle smile, but I was not convinced. Unable to hide my dissatisfaction, I puffed out my cheeks. The next day, holding the key given to me by the lawyer, I walked to the shed near the farmland Dad had once rented. The few minutes' walk was on a quiet country road with barely another soul in sight. Finally arriving at the farmland Dad had rented, I looked over the field and opened the shed's lock. This place is really dusty. The shed, opened for the first time in a while, was covered in dust. Thinking there might be some of Dad's belongings left, I started to thoroughly search inside the shed. I can't find anything valuable. In the end, the shed was just full of old things. The only items found were Dad's old gardening tools. While these could be considered memorabilia, they didn't seem to hold any particular value. Well, I guess I'll take these back with me for now. Murmuring to myself, I took another careful look around the shed. That's when a question suddenly crossed my mind. Compared to how it looked from the outside, this place looks much smaller. The inside of the shed was dim and felt cramped. Stepping outside, the odd feeling about the interior didn't leave my mind. Intrigued by this suspicious feeling, I decided to check the back of the shed. The back faced a forest thick with overgrown trees, and unexpectedly, I found another door there. There's another entrance on the back side. Surprised, yet excited by the discovery, I noted that from the inside, that part just looked like a regular wall. However, from the outside, there was clearly a door. What's going on here? Pondering, I try to figure out the situation. Normally, the door should be visible from the inside too, but it was completely overlooked from within the shed. I see. Suddenly, it felt like I had solved the mystery. Perhaps, there was an invisible wall inside, and a secret space accessible only from the back side. Realizing this possibility, I was thrilled at the thought of a surprise my father might have left behind. He was always good at planning surprises, always preparing something special for my birthdays. Fond memories resurfaced, and before I knew it, tears were rolling down my cheeks. I hurried back inside the shed, starting to look for the key to the hidden door. If it was my father, he surely hid it cleverly somewhere. Led by a hunch, I searched all over the shed. After some time, I found two keys hidden behind a picture of a shovel. Taking one of them to the back side, I inserted it into the door, and with a click, the door opened. What could be inside? With my heart pounding, I opened the door to find a very narrow space. It was just a few feet wide, 
and in it stood a large safe. Discovering the safe, I was overwhelmed with nostalgia. It was the same safe that used to sit quietly in the corner of my father's office when I visited his company as a child. Ah, this safe brings back memories. The moment I touched the safe, vivid memories of days spent with my father came flooding back. It wasn't just any inheritance from a shed, it was a treasure trove of precious memories with my father. The significance of this discovery was immeasurable, but knowing my father, this couldn't be the end of it. If it was dad, he must have prepared even more surprises. With that thought in my heart, I inserted the other key I held into the safe and slowly turned it. As the rusty sound of the safe echoed, the moment the door slowly opened, my eyes widened in shock. What? This is. Seeing the contents of the safe, I was lost for words, overwhelmed by surprise and emotion. Inside was a legacy far beyond my imagination. I have to tell mom about this right away. I quickly closed and locked the safe before heading to my mother's place. After discussing it with my husband, I got his help to bring the precious safe back home. However, once the safe was at home, I realized an important fact. The contents of this safe were definitely my father's, and combined with the inheritance from the shed, it might incur inheritance tax. We should get this properly checked. The items stored in the safe were clearly valuable at first glance. Deciding what to do, I contacted Mr. Smith to consult about the inheritance. Regarding the inheritance tax, it seems. According to Mr. Smith's advice, it turned out that the best course of action was to leave the detailed procedures to a tax accountant. I contacted a tax accountant recommended by the lawyer and decided to leave all the complicated procedures to him. Half a year passed, and the situation with the inheritance began to move forward. During a rare moment of rest in my busy life, my sister suddenly showed up at my home. What brings you here all of a sudden? Well, I had some business at the family home. I just stopped by on my way back. That's all. Something was off about Emma. There's a considerable distance from our family home to where I live, and our relationship has been a bit strained since the inheritance issue with our father. The idea of her just stopping by didn't quite add up. Unable to hide my suspicion, I closely watched my sister's actions. Is it okay if I come in? Sure, but what's up? Is there something you need? Actually, there's something I need to talk to you about. As she said this, my sister forced a smile. I reluctantly let her in, served her some tea, and after she calmed down a bit, she seemed to be hinting at something. Did you, by any chance, win the lottery or something? No, nothing like that. Then, was it a special bonus your husband got or something? I was puzzled by her question. I have no interest in lotteries, and my husband's didn't get any special bonus, so I tilted my head at her question. Wondering what her intention was, I decided to ask her directly. What are you talking about? In response, her sister suddenly raised her voice. Are you making fun of me? What do you mean? It's about the money. You got money from somewhere, didn't you? Money? Yes, money. I heard about it. She started talking excitedly. Her story seemed to be related to an event that happened a few days ago. Living in the city, Emma recently met a distant relative of our mother by chance. The conversation they had then sparked the ensuing situation. You really did a lot for your father, didn't you? Yes, it was quite tough. I visited him several times too. That's very kind of you. We're grateful. But, was it really necessary to send us that token of appreciation after that? Token of appreciation? What do you mean? It was from your sister. 
She sent gift certificates worth several thousand dollars as a thank you for the visits. Gift certificates? That was the exchange that took place, she said. What particularly caught Emma's attention was the mention of the gift certificates. Hearing that I had sent them gift certificates, she mistakenly thought I got my hands on some extra money. Did something good happen? Tell me all about it. Saying so, Emma pressed me for information. Oh, that story. I sighed deeply, but my attitude seemed to anger her further. Why are you acting like this? Are you making fun of me? No, it's about the thank you. I arranged for the gift certificates. But where did the money come from? That's what I'm curious about. Well, it came from the inheritance. The inheritance? What do you mean? I mean, after receiving the inheritance, I sent the relatives a thank you. Emma was not happy with my answer. But all you got was that old, dirty shed, right? That's true. How does a shed turn into money? I found a hidden safe in the shed. It contained Dad's real legacy. A safe? There was really such an inheritance? My words changed Emma's expression to one of shock, showing disbelief. I decided to explain in more detail about the contents of the safe hidden in the shed. The safe in the shed was filled with numerous valuable watches. These were part of a collection my father had amassed as a hobby. However, I couldn't comprehend the exact value of those watches. Additionally, the total amount of savings left by dad was about $100,000, a pretty modest sum considering he was a successful businessman. This was likely due to his investment in the expensive watch collection. If those watches are valuable, we'll need to pay inheritance tax. Upon seeing the contents of the safe, that's what my mother said. So, what should we do? I asked, and after a moment of thought, my mother replied. We can't hide this. We need to declare it properly. What exactly should we do? Let's consult with a lawyer and follow the proper procedures. We contacted Mr. Smith, the lawyer who had visited us before, to discuss the issue of inheritance tax for the valuables. From him, we learned that taxes are calculated based on the current value of the inherited items, and he referred us to a professional tax accountant. After handing everything over to the tax accountant we were referred to, it became clear that the watch collection was worth tens of millions of dollars. When inheriting items of such value, it's essential to pay the taxes accurately. How should the payment be made? How about selling it to someone who knows its value and keeping the rest? Following the accountant's suggestion, I decided to sell the watches whose value I didn't fully understand. By selling the expensive watches, I paid the inheritance tax from the proceeds. With the leftover funds, I sent gift certificates as a thank you to relatives who had visited us. That was the origin of the gift certificates story my sister heard about. What remained with me were memorable items like the special pocket watch my father cherished. While talking about this, I showed my sister my father's pocket watch. This might not be very valuable, but it holds the deepest memories for me. Hearing my story, my sister frowned in dissatisfaction. What, there's nothing else left? There is, but most of it is still in the safe. Where's the safe? Mom is keeping it. It's the safe that was used at the company, too heavy to bring here. My sister's gaze wandered as if she was contemplating something. I sensed a bit of unease in her expression. However, that anxiety soon vanished, and she abruptly stood up. I'm leaving. I understand about the money. And then she left. I was worried she might hassle me for the money from the sold watches. Surprisingly, she left without much fuss. I felt a sense of relief. But, I didn't fully understand my sister. 
I was reminded of this when I received a call from my mother late at night. We're in trouble. Can you come over right away? What happened, mom? Just hurry. My mother was panicking, and she didn't provide clear details. My husband and I rushed to her place. As we were approaching our family home, we noticed something was off. For some reason, the area around our house was unusually well lit. What in the world is this? The answer became clear as we got closer to the house. When I arrived, the area around our family home was swarming with police cars. Confused by the unusual scene, I pushed through the crowd, hurrying to my worried-looking mother. Mom, are you okay? What happened? Something rather serious happened. According to my mother, feeling more tired than usual, she had gone to bed early but soon noticed a strange noise. It sounded like someone rummaging through the house. Convinced it must be a burglar, she was so scared that she hurriedly left the house and fled to the neighbors. Light from a flashlight was visible inside the house, clearly indicating someone was there. My mother therefore approached the neighbor. Please help, there's a burglar in my house. She shouted. Hearing this, the neighbor immediately rushed outside and saw the light moving in the direction my mother pointed out. Believing it to be a burglar as well, they called the police. However, the outcome was entirely unexpected. The intruder was none other than my sister, who had snuck into the house looking for the safe after hearing my story. Neither my mother nor the neighbor knew this, leading to a huge commotion with the police being called. Surprised by the sight of all the police, my sister panicked and tried to flee. Although it was her own family home and there was no need to run, confused, she attempted to escape. During this, she bumped into the door of the safe, losing her balance. The safe fell towards her, trapping her and leaving her unable to move. Standing next to my mother, I tried to comprehend the full extent of what had occurred. Mom, are you okay? Is it true that my sister got hurt? Yes, it's true. Shocking, right? I hope it's not a severe injury. She was taken to the hospital by ambulance. She keeps saying her leg hurts. My sister really, what was she thinking? I couldn't hide my confusion and dismay. After the police officers arrived, we explained the situation and apologized. It was late at night, so with a heavy heart, I called my sister's husband. Wait, she broke into her own home? Yes, something like that. What was she thinking, not even taking care of her own home? I'm really sorry about my sister. That's all right. I'm planning to use this as an opportunity to get a divorce. You're getting a divorce. According to Emma's husband, she had accumulated a significant amount of debt. She had spent a lot on luxury brands, and when this fact came to light, it caused a major argument between them. When leaving the house, Emma firmly told her mother, I will definitely pay it back. Unbeknownst to me, Emma had used the inherited $100,000 to pay off her debts and came to me in a financially desperate state. Knowing about the safe, she devised a plan to sneak into the family home. Emma's husband's fury was understandable, and after breaking her leg and being hospitalized. When Emma and her husband faced each other in the hospital, he made his intention to get a divorce clear. I will never agree to a divorce. But Emma's husband was resolute and had brought the divorce papers with him. Seeing them, Emma eventually had no choice but to give in. After signing the divorce papers in the hospital bed, she was just staring blankly. In the corner of the hospital room, there was a magazine with job listings, likely as she intended to find work to pay off her debts. I felt somewhat relieved. Meanwhile, after the commotion settled, I decided to return to my family home. It was a decision made out of concern for my mother, but there was another significant reason. 
I had found out I was pregnant. After discussing with my husband, we decided I'd go back home to have the baby. I had wanted to tell my father about the pregnancy while he was still alive, but now I'm sure he would be happy. I wholeheartedly wish to have a healthy baby. This upcoming birth might also offer some solace to my mother. I want to watch this new life grow, cherishing my father's memory and looking forward to the future alongside my mother. If you're feeling like you have no place right now, carrying painful thoughts, it's okay. There surely is a place for you somewhere. That's the kind of song I want to sing, as if whispering in your ear. From a life at rock bottom to making a major debut, that's me. No matter how famous I become, I vow to never forget to be there for others. My name is Mia. I'm 27 years old. My parents both graduated from a renowned music college. My father is a pianist, and my mother is a violinist. So, naturally, both my sister and I attended piano lessons from a young age. You could say we're a music family. Just because they graduated from a music college doesn't mean my parents are artists. My father teaches piano at a major music school. After my younger sister was born, my mother, who used to teach violin, started giving private lessons at home. Being a couple who graduated from a music college, our house is completely soundproof, so no matter how poorly we played our practice pieces, we never received complaints from the neighbors. This could be considered living off music, in a way. We weren't rich, but our family lived in a detached house with a garden in the suburbs of New York, and we had a grand piano. My grandparents, who sent their son to a music college, were quite wealthy, and the same was true for my maternal grandparents. The marriage of the two, who met during their time in music college, was greatly celebrated by both sets of grandparents. So, when it came to building a new house upon marriage, I heard that both received substantial support from their parents. For both sets of grandparents, sending their children to a music college was somewhat of a status symbol, akin to a brand preference, I suppose. It's not strange for a couple who graduated from a music college to want their children to pursue music. But I hated piano lessons. The beginner's Bayer was just boring. It was all monotonous repetition and never fun. So, I would hit the keys at random and sing surreal songs I made up, always getting scolded by my piano teacher. I was what you might call a problem child. My sister, Kate, started attending the piano lessons two years later and was a model student who obediently listened to the teacher. Plus, she was very cute, so it's understandable that my parents' expectations focused on her. As for me, with my curly hair, flat nose, and freckles, I couldn't exactly be called cute. So, it makes sense that my parents' affection was directed towards my sister. This was the case not just for our parents, but also for both sets of grandparents and other relatives. I was always compared to my sister, who was always praised for being more excellent and cute. Not only our parents and grandparents, but neither the piano teacher nor any of the adult relatives took any interest in me. Perhaps I should have just diligently attended piano lessons and shown a spirited effort, but I didn't. The thought that, no matter how hard I tried, no one would recognize my efforts. My parents probably heard plenty about my poor performance from the beginner's lesson teacher. When I quit the piano lessons, neither my father nor my mother said anything. Occasionally, when I felt like it, I would play random melodies on our piano at home and sing along. Since I lacked the basics, it was all a mess, but that was fun for me. You shouldn't do that, sis. It's not okay to just touch the piano like that. And your playing is all over the place. One day, as I was happily singing, my sister criticized me. 
It's fine, really. It's fun, so you should try it too, Kate. Saying this, my sister sat down hesitantly next to me and started playing the keys. For the first time, we played the piano together, almost like a duet. It was really fun, but then our mother came storming in and said. What are you two doing? Mia. You're not to touch the piano anymore. Kate, don't imitate your sister. She shouted, taking the piano away from me. I didn't hate my sister, but I felt jealous and had a complex mix of emotions. Sometimes I wondered if I would have been more loved by our parents if my sister had never been born. I hated myself for thinking that way. At my sister's piano recital one day, she wore a brand new dress and looked like a princess. My parents did buy me new clothes too, but I clearly looked inferior. It wasn't because of the clothes, but because I was not as pretty as her. In contrast, my adorable sister played beautifully, earning applause from the audience. Next to a beautiful and talented sister, I was just a dropout who couldn't play the keys properly. Even at family dinners, Kate was always the center of attention. My parents would eagerly respond to her stories, smile affectionately, and praise her for even the smallest things. I tried to get their attention too, but their responses were cold at best, merely nodding along. Mind your manners. Eat your food quietly. I was scolded like this sometimes. To the outside world, we might seem like a wealthy family with a piano, with parents who graduated from a music college, and daughters who are well off. But why is only my sister loved? Why does mom only hug her? Why does dad only gently stroke her head? If my sister scores 80, they praise her happily, but even if I score 100, they just coldly laugh and say I luck charm. Since childhood, I've concluded that I was just an unattractive failure. However, it's not like I wasn't fed or beaten every day, some might think these are luxurious worries. But inside our home, I felt like I had no place. When I entered middle school, I joined the music club. It was a regular club activity at a public middle school. For my parents, who thought only classical music was real music, jazz, rock, and pop were simply other genres. Well, that might suit Mia, I suppose. My father said mockingly. Just don't bring a guitar into the house. And my mother added. The music club had instruments, but they were all worn out, apparently donated by alumni. Donation sounds nice, but essentially, they left behind what they didn't need anymore. And the club members were two seniors, for sophomores, and including me, only three freshmen. Surprisingly, in this music club, not even half of the members could play an instrument. After school, they would just come to the club room, listen to their favorite music through earphones, or watch videos unrelated to music. But I found this relaxed atmosphere comforting. There was a senior boy who was good at guitar, named Tony. Tony knew a lot about old popular music and would perform it with his acoustic guitar. His guitar skills were great, but his singing was so-so, which was quite amusing to listen to. Tony, how do you know so much about old music? When I asked that. Both my dad and mom love music. You could say we're a musical family, I guess. While saying this, he started to play music. Once, while casually humming along to Tony's guitar. Mia, you're really good at singing. He was really surprised. I hated not just how I looked, but also my voice because it wasn't feminine like my sister's. Following Tony's encouragement, I sang a song. Before I knew it, other club members were also listening to me, facing my direction. Nice. I've never heard live singing this good before. This song is tough, but you've got a great range. And your slightly husky voice is really nice. 
Hearing this from everyone, I blushed because I wasn't used to being praised. But I was incredibly happy. For the first time, I felt acknowledged and praised by many. Just that made me tear up, and though everyone in the club room was confused, they all showed concern and comforted me. Since that day, I started singing with Tony's guitar accompaniment. From old to new songs, club members made requests. It was truly sad when Tony graduated. Mia, you're such a crybaby. Why don't you come to the same high school as me? I'll be waiting. That's what Tony told me. Let's keep playing guitar and singing together, really. I was overjoyed by those words, but then Tony said. My family is having a graduation celebration. Do you want to come with us? Tony's family, consisting of his parents, a younger brother, and a younger sister, was a family of five. The celebration was planned at a family restaurant. The younger brother and sister were making a fuss, excited that their brother brought a girlfriend. The father teased about Tony being all grown up post-graduation, while the mother was surprised, saying. When did he get such a cute girlfriend? She's not my girlfriend. She's a music buddy. Tony said, a bit flustered, his face turning red. Being called cute is a first for me. Thank you. And I had an embarrassed smile which made the whole family laugh. You guys better listen closely, her singing is really good. Despite Tony raising the bar high, his family gave me a heartfelt round of applause after I finished singing. I really love your voice. And I think you're cute too. Tony confessed quietly in my ear. It was like a dream come true. Tony's family was so kind and warm. As we were leaving, I couldn't help but I said. I wish I was born into Tony's family. I muttered that without thinking. Hearing this, Tony looked a bit like he was going to cry and gently patted my head. Tony's high school is a regular public high school, and with my current grades, I should be able to pass without any problems. When I told my parents about it, they seemed uninterested in my education. When I said I wanted to go to this high school, all they said was. Is that so? Just that. They were probably too preoccupied with what to do about my sister's education. Eventually, my sister was set to go to a flexible private middle school, where my parents would continue her technical music lessons. Obviously, this was to prepare her for music college. It was probably convenient for them that I went to a public school, considering the private school fees. Even during my exam studies, I sometimes visited Tony's house. When I successfully passed the high school entrance exams, Tony's parents celebrated and were happier for me than my own parents. And what awaited me in high school was a well-equipped music club, complete with a drum set, which surprised me. We've heard about you from Tony. Welcome to the music club, Mia. I was welcomed by the senior club members. I'm Mia. I can play the keyboard a bit. I introduced myself like that and then Tony interjected. No, that's not right. Mia is a vocalist, right? That's why we're forming a band. There's a high school band competition organized by a music store in the fall, and it's decided we'll be participating. They participated last year too, but couldn't win any awards because the vocals were lacking. In our opinion, it was still better than most. That's why I told you, I'm not good at singing. The vocals that were lacking last year were Tony's. I told the seniors that a really good vocalist would be joining us next year, and they were all looking forward to it. Tony said that with a smile. Despite just having entered the school, Tony had already made a place for me. Some of the other first-year students who joined at the same time felt a bit envious, wondering why I was getting special treatment. But after hearing me sing, everyone understood and agreed. I couldn't thank Tony enough.
Tony, I can never thank you enough for what you've done for me. I'm truly grateful. On our way walking home together, I said that to Tony. You're crying again. You're still a crybaby, Mia. Tony said that and gently patted my head. We were runners-up in the high school band competition, but I was awarded best vocalist. During my three years of high school, I enjoyed a lot of good music and moved out right after graduating. My parents were too focused on sending my sister to music college. So, what I did didn't matter to them. Tony and I naturally started living together, working as a waiter and a bartender at a live house while doing live performances. The band we formed in high school continued into our adult lives, and it was very fun to perform on stage with close friends. Occasionally, I hear from my sister Kate. She graduated from music college and went into teaching. When I decided to congratulate her and visited home after a long time, my parents looked at me very coldly. My long, brightly dyed hair and many ear piercings must have surprised them as they frowned upon seeing me. When I revealed that I work as a bartender at a live house, their attitude was clearly disdainful. A dropout who can barely play the keyboard might just be right up your alley. My mother looked at me as if I was a failure. Embarrassing. You're a laughingstock even among our relatives. My father called me the disgrace of our family. It confirmed once again that there was no place for me in this house. But my sister was different. Sis, you're not planning to come back to this house, are you? I'm envious of you. As she said this, she looked down. Envious? Of me? How could you understand anything about me when you've been loved by our parents your whole life? I thought this but couldn't say it out loud because my sister looked so sad. Now I understand. My sister was a victim too. I'm more nervous here than on stage. It's okay, it's no different from our usual gigs. He said, patting my head like he always does. Today is my wedding party. It wasn't really my style, but I wanted to announce it to acquaintances and thought it was a good opportunity for us to mark the occasion. Still, it being out of character for us, we opted not for a formal ceremony but for a casual stand-up party outdoors. Instead of a wedding dress, I wore a white dress that was more revealing than typical for a bride, adapted from one of my stage outfits. At the party venue, my parents and all the relatives were completely out of place. My parents did accept the invitation, but, after seeing the atmosphere of the venue, my father approached me to complain. What is this? All the relatives are laughing. It's shameful. Indeed, most of my friends were from the music scene, and their attire was more suited for a live house than a wedding. In this setting, my mother, dressed up properly, seemed almost out of place. Now, let's have a song from the bride and groom for everyone. When I sat down in front of the white grand piano, the relatives began to laugh. Isn't she the failure of a musical family? Isn't she embarrassed to play the piano in front of people? I could hear such voices. But I'm not bothered by that anymore. As I began playing the intro, the venue quieted down a bit. I've heard this song somewhere before. As I started singing, everyone in the venue was listening intently to my song, including my parents. The band members joined in halfway through, helping to elevate the song. After the song finished, applause erupted from the previously silent venue. Isn't this the song from that TV? Right. Wasn't it really popular on that video site? Wow. Is that the real deal? But those lyrics, you know. Whispers like that reached my ears. The song I sang was about a child who grew up unloved finding their place in the world. Wrapped in mild words, it became quite the topic online as a critique of toxic parenting. Good evening, everyone. 
Thank you so much for attending our wedding party and our major debut celebration. We deeply appreciate the support you've all given us up until now and ask for your continued support in the future. As Tony made his speech, crackers sounded throughout the venue, and everyone started making noise. Our activities, centered around live performances and online streaming, had been recognized, and we had become a popular band before we knew it. And then, signing with a major label happened. Mia, that's amazing. I've heard that song before. The relatives, flipping their stance, said that to me. Truly a musical family, aren't you? Just a minute ago, they called me a failure. But, those lyrics, well. They said this while smirking and looking at my parents. The meaning behind those lyrics includes you too, not just my parents. My parents themselves were trembling with red faces. What are you thinking, bringing us to a place like this, making us feel ashamed in front of everyone? That's not music. Are you not embarrassed to sell out your parents like that? Indeed, my song that used my parents as a subject had hit big, but once again, I realized my feelings would never get through to them. Shouldn't the first thing you say to Mia be an apology? Tony stepped in between me and my parents. Don't you understand how much she's been hurt since she was a child? What? Who are you to talk about things that don't concern you? At that perfect moment, my sister Kate arrived. Sis, that was amazing. When I saw that commercial on TV, I knew immediately it was you. Saying so, she hugged me. My parents looked on, dumbfounded. The only one who had musical talent in our house was you, sis. Mom and Dad had their pride in being music college graduates, but they never really enjoyed music. After graduating from music college, Kate became a middle school music teacher. I may not have had much talent, but I want the kids to enjoy music, something maybe Mom and Dad wouldn't understand. Kate must be an excellent teacher, no doubt. What's gotten into you, Kate? You've never talked back to us like this before. Yes, my mother was flustered. Is this Mia's influence? Our dear Kate has changed. The hardships Kate had to endure, pretending to be the perfect child under our parents' command, were something they would never understand. Dad, Mom, thank you for coming today. Today is not just our wedding and our major debut. It's also the day I've decided to part ways with you. I no longer consider you my parents. Goodbye. I told my parents this and then stood close to Tony. Mia is now part of our family. My parents, my brother, and my sister, although not related by blood, all consider me a family. Tony's family watched warmly from a distance. The band members I had shared both good and bad times with since high school, and above all, Tony, that's where I belong. Having been abandoned by their beloved daughter Kate as well, my parents left, disheartened. Not long after, Kate also left home and started living on her own. Despite my parents' tearful attempts to persuade her, she wouldn't listen at all. Lately, Kate sometimes joins my band's live performances as a keyboardist. Do you remember? The time we played the piano together. It was so much fun. I remember. It was one of the few happy memories from that house. I'm thrilled we can make music together again. Music is about enjoying the sound. Somewhere along the line, my complex about my sister disappeared. Now, she's a sister I'm proud of. With my beautiful sister's help, our fan base seems to be expanding. The news that the song was about our parents spread, and I heard my father's music school's enrollment increased. But behind the scenes, he's called the toxic parent teacher, and it's taking its toll on him. My mother also, unable to bear the cold looks from relatives and neighbors, quit giving private lessons. 
It's sad if all that's left after pouring so much love into your favorite daughter is worthless pride. And inside me, a new life is growing. I wonder, can I truly love this child? Sometimes, I feel so unsure. As I caressed my growing belly, I voiced my fears. Mia will be fine. And even if, by some chance, something happens, I will love both Mia and our child. Tony said this, his ear pressed to my belly, whispering. You're right. There's no way I wouldn't love Tony's child. I'm really grateful to you. Thank you. I realized how incredibly happy I am right now.